If I were to start a greenfield project today with a small team, I'd create a monolith, not microservices. Here are the reasons why I wouldn't start with a microservices architecture and why boundaries are key. Hey everybody, it's Derek Comartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design in .NET. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. So when I'm talking about a greenfield project with a small team, really what I'm referencing is the, the idea that I have, I'm going into domain that I do not know anything about. I don't have any existing system as a reference point. My knowledge is I'm, I'm a blank canvas. I don't really know anything yet. And I've said this over and over again, is that getting boundaries right within a system are really difficult to do in my opinion, yet they're the most important thing to do. And when you're creating a, a new system, being able to refactor and change the way that the system works or your understanding of how the system works is going to be much more feasible in a monolith than they are microservices. So the analogy I always use when I'm talking about kind of discovery and boundaries is I like to think of the system as say you're walking into a pitch black room. So you open the door, it's completely black and all you really have is a flashlight. What you're doing is you're kind of shining that flashlight around, you're kind of getting the feel for what the room looks like, the things in the room, um, kind of where everything is potentially in that room. As you're shining the flashlight around, over time, you become more familiar with what is in the room. You get a better kind of conceptual idea of what everything is, where stuff lies in the room. That's kind of like to me walking into a brand new domain that you have no idea about. You're going in blank. You, you can't see anything. You don't know anything. And it takes a lot of work and discovery to figure out where the boundaries lie. And most importantly, when we're talking about boundaries is what are the capabilities within a boundary? What are the business capabilities? And behind that, what's the data behind those capabilities? So figuring out boundaries is probably the most difficult thing to do. And if you're going to try to start off with microservices, what, what services are you creating? You don't really even know yet. So in the videos and talks I've done about a loosely coupled monolith is your, a monolith isn't a big ball of mud. Really what I've done in a lot of the videos that I've created is I'm really talking about building a monolith, kind of using the same ideas that you would essentially use within microservices, but using them within a monolith. That's why I call it a loosely coupled monolith is that you want to reduce coupling, even though you're deploying a single monolithic application, that doesn't necessarily mean, I think, what it does to most people or perceive to what a monolith is. I think most people think of a monolith as this. They think of just this monolithic application that is a big ball of mud that there's a ton of coupling to, and you have a single database. But that's not really the case is Really what I like to think of is first is having well-defined boundaries within that monolith so that you don't have type coupling between these things. So in the example of my loosely coupled monolith, I kind of have three different contexts. I have a sales context, a warehouse and billing, and there could be more than this. And generally what I've been showing in some of my slides is that each one of those contexts has its own database. Somebody posted a comment in one of those videos saying, can I just use the same database and make sure that the schemas are kept separate? Exactly. This is a, um, a conceptual idea, not necessarily a physical one. So it doesn't uh, need to be that your monolith has a single or has a database for each different boundary within it. It could be a single database instance, but there's each its own schema within it. So for example, sales within our loosely coupled monolith here is referencing this database instance and just referencing its particular tables or its schema that it has. The same thing with warehouse and the same thing with billing. There's no billing referencing or making calls and queries to this particular schema or the sales schema. They have their own schemas and we don't want to couple between using our database. So yes, you're using a shared database, shared database server, but you're not coupling by schema. These are things are still independent. So another way to show this is this conceptual idea is you could still view it like this, where each different boundary within your monolith has its own database. 
And if you were to do this, okay, you have a single instance. If you're to do this, you could actually do this. You could actually have each different context have its own database. And as I've mentioned, if that's the case, then you can, in my scaling video, you can decide to scale these databases differently or maybe add read replicas to sales, whatever the case may be. Maybe this needs to be a larger instance if you're in the cloud, whatever the case may be, is that you can scale these differently. But conceptually, it's just that each one has its own database. But yes, you could use a shared database. So the next piece of the puzzle that I've always mentioned is to use a message broker. And that's where the asynchronous messaging or the loosely coupled part of it comes from is that instead of these particular boundaries communicating in process with each other, you're still publishing messages and events to a message broker and consuming them basically within your monolith. So everything's coming out from the monolith and back into the monolith, but reaching the particular boundary that actually cares about those particular messages. So if you go from here, you can think of, well, if this if billing has no dependency on any other particular uh, boundary and it has its own database, then really what you're doing is you're just, it's just a deployment concern at this point. You're just deploying this monolith together. And if you want to get to the point where you need to scale differently in terms of actual team size and become scaling becomes not necessarily a, a request load issue, but actual development um, people working on an actual particular part of the system and you wanna deploy those things separately, then you can start separating these things into microservices or services, whatever size you consider these things, and just be them independent. And guess what? You're using a microservices architecture. In my opinion, creating a monolith using the same concept and principles as you would as microservices at the beginning of a Greenfield project with a small team is easily the way to go. If you need to refactor, which you will, as you make more discoveries, as you're shining that light, you can move code around into different boundaries into if you got to move something from sales or a piece of data from sales to billing or warehouse, wherever the case may be, you can refactor this because you have a single unified code base and you're deploying that code base as a single unit. So if you, for example, need to change a particular message or you need to change the, the properties of the data in a message, you can refactor that and you know for cert with certainty that everywhere else a part of the system is going to be using that uh, new event or that new property. You don't have to worry about, oh, is there this old service? We need to version this and keep backwards compatibility. Everything's getting changed at once. If you need to move things around, you know you're doing it in a single unified code base. And as I've said, boundaries are hard to get right. In a monolith, this is going to be way easier to move stuff around and refactor than it would be in microservices. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. If you're into software architecture and design, make sure to subscribe. Thanks.